Hello everyone, welcome to my talk on how we automatically generate TypeScript definitions for Cloudflare workers using TypeScript. As a quick introduction, I'm Brendan, I created Miniflare, a fully local simulator for Cloudflare workers. Uh, I'm now a systems engineer at Cloudflare, specifically focusing on workers developer tooling. So I've mentioned Cloudflare workers a few times already, but what are they? Workers are basically a functions as a service platform. You write some HTTP handling code, publish it to our platform, then we give you a URL you can hit to run it. Our runtime provides standard APIs similar to what you'd find in a web browser. We deploy your code to all Cloudflare Edge locations, so your users get low latency access wherever they are. Importantly, there's practically no cold start time, because our runtime is based on V8 isolates, not containers or virtual machines. In addition to standard web APIs, we also provide non-standard runtime APIs for things like accessing key value storage. So the key points that we've got so far are custom V8 runtime based uh, like Node or Dino. Um, we implement mostly web standard APIs like browsers, uh, but also implement some non-standard APIs specifically for server-side use cases. Um, so with all this in mind, why do we want types? Well, we want type checking to prevent errors at runtime, and we also want auto-completion in IDEs so users can easily explore the type surface. Okay, so with that introduction out of the way, let me give you a summary of what I'm going to be talking about today. To start, we'll cover how we used to do handwritten types a couple of years ago. Uh, then we'll look at our auto-generation approach using runtime type information. After that, we'll look at some transformations we can do to improve other types. Uh, and then we'll focus on how we allow manual type overrides to improve the developer ergonomics. And finally, we'll have a quick look at compatibility dates. So first off, how we did types a few years ago. Like most runtimes, we had an NPM package providing global types for our runtime. Think like types node or bun types, but for workers. Importantly, this package only included Cloudflare specific APIs like HTML rewriter and not web standards. So users would need to include both libwebworker and the npm package in their TS configs. There were quite a few problems with this approach. Firstly, these types were handwritten, making them error prone to update. Secondly, these types weren't typically updated by the team implementing the runtime, making them slow to update with new APIs. Uh, on the right, we've got an example of a type error using a new API, even though that code should run more fine in workers. However, the biggest problem was with our reliance on libwebworker. This included APIs like message channel, which we didn't implement, uh, meaning code type checked that wouldn't actually run in our runtime. Uh, and workers' runtime APIs at the time weren't fully spec compliant. So we hadn't implemented like the readable stream constructor, but again, this would type check fine. Um, we were also missing experimental APIs that we had implemented. Uh, so there are a few problems here. Now that we've seen all the problems, what should we do about them? So the workers runtime provides a runtime type information system. This allows us to query types at runtime and is, was originally used for automated fuzz testing. Runtime type information is encoded as cap and proto, which we use as a language and platform independent binary format, kind of like protocol buffers if you've used those before. Um, it's basically a typed version of JSON. Um, so this is our cap and proto schema for type information. Uh, you can see that this kind of maps to TypeScript types. The really nice thing about cap and proto is that it can generate encoding and decoding code for you from your schema for many different languages. Um, importantly, this means that we don't have to implement all stages of the auto-generation pipeline in the same language. We can encode all runtime API types in C++ and then do further processing in TypeScript. This allows us to use the TypeScript compiler API for actually rendering TypeScript. What we want to do is build a TypeScript AST ourselves from runtime type information. As an example, we'll try build the KV namespace interface we've just seen. We'll build from the bottom of the tree, so we'll start with the key parameter for the get method, then we'll build the get method's return type and the method itself. Then we'll build the interface containing the get method. Then we'll create a placeholder source file and printer so we can print out the interface to a string and log that to the console. If we run that, we get what expected. All of that for three lines of TypeScript. This is a very verbose API, but with a bit more work to convert cap and proto types into TypeScript, we have auto generated types. This pretty much solves all of our problems from earlier. We've got exactly the APIs that implemented in the runtime uh, with the minor spec differences, but the types still aren't perfect. For example, iterators don't have correctly typed values, we can't use any global functions or constants, and we don't have function overloads, so TypeScript can't narrow return types given arguments. Luckily, all the information we need to fix these problems are already in the types. Uh, what we need to do is transform them into a form TypeScript recognizes. So we'll start with fixing iterators. Uh, this is what our types look like at the moment. We want to use TypeScript's built-in iterable iterator type instead, uh, and the transition kind of looks something like that. Um, to fix globals, we need to extract service worker global scopes members into the global scope, and this will need to include superclasses too. So again, we need to perform something like this. Um, so how do we actually do this? Let's look at a simpler example. Say we want to replace all strings with numbers. We can write a tra TypeScript transformer for this that recursively visits all nodes, and if we find a string token, we replace it with a number, otherwise we keep visiting children nodes. Then we can use the TS transform API to apply this to an AST node. Let's see what TypeScript is doing when we call this function. We start at the root kv namespace interface declaration and we do a depth first search until we find a string. When we do, we replace it with a number and we keep going until all nodes have been replaced. 
Applying this technique to our other transformations allows us to fix the first two problems, so iterators are now typed correctly and we can use global functions and constants. For overloads, we need something a little more complicated. What we want in our TypeScript types is something like this, where we have a correspondence between the input and output types. For example, when we specify text, we expect a string. When we specify array buffer, we expect an array buffer, and so on. The problem is that in the C++ code for KV namespaces, there's no correspondence between input type and output result. So how do we know what to generate? We need some additional human input here. There are other places where we need human input too, to, to improve the developer ergonomics. So as we've already seen, we need this function for function overloads. Uh, we also need additional input to add type parameters, Sometimes we want to rename types to be less verbose. Sometimes we want to completely replace the auto-generated definition with something different. And sometimes we just want to hide the type because it shouldn't be exposed to end users. We solve this by allowing partial TypeScript code to be inserted alongside C++ code. This is encoded with the runtime type information in Cap and Proto. Then we merge this with the generated definition. We can use this mechanism for all of the cases we've just highlighted. Uh, and importantly, because we're co-locating overrides with the C++ code, it's much easier for runtime developers to add these in and keep them up to date. With that, we've solved all the problems from earlier, and we have a solid set of type definitions for workers. But there's one more thing we could do to make them even better. Sometimes people make mistakes. Uh, developers are no different, and sometimes we introduce bugs into our code. Sometimes fixing those bugs would introduce breaking behavior changes. But we don't want to break existing deployed code. So when you upload your worker code, you have to specify a compatibility date. We put breaking changes behind a compatibility flag, which have a date when they are enabled by default. If your worker's def compatibility date is after a compatibility flag's default on date, then that flag will be enabled. And we also allow you to manually enable or disable specific flags. The problem is that some flags change the public API surface and therefore the TypeScript types. For instance, the global navigator flag adds a new navigator constant to the global scope. There are currently 41 compatibility flags, uh, although not all of them change the type surface. But if we generated a version for the types for all possible combination of flags, we'd end up with over 2 trillion type definition files, which is kind of infeasible. Um, instead, our solution at the moment is to generate an entry point of the types for each compatibility date that changes the public API surface. Um, this doesn't completely solve the problem, as users can still selectively enable and disable flags. Um, what we're planning to do is build types as a service, which would be a Cloudflare worker that dynamically generates NPM packages containing TypeScript definition files based on the selected compatibility date and flags. So I'd encourage you to try out Cloudflare workers if you haven't already. Uh, you can find all of the type generation scripts in the Cloudflare worker D GitHub repo and find me on GitHub and Twitter. Thank you very much for listening.